Okay, I think we should start now because, okay, uh, hi everyone, welcome and thanks for uh, showing up for the FPUK meeting. This is, um, it's great to see so many people and so many familiar fa faces and it's, it's great that people made it from really far away places like Durham and Edinburgh. So, um, uh, really nice to have this meeting and hopefully uh, the whole idea of this meeting is to get uh, as, as, is, as has been the case for FPUK meetings in the past, is to get the UK theory community, HEPTH community, uh, interacting and probably having collaborations. Hopefully this meeting will foster some collaborations. So in the interest of keeping things rolling according to time, uh, do I, should I say a few things, Carlos? Logistics? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, good, yes. So, so important things. Uh, the, the outside area of the auditorium, the ground floor. So as you get outside, there is a foyer, and if you walk down, there's a ground floor. Uh, and the ground floor is where the refreshments and lunch and everything will be served. That's where we'll have the poster sessions. And there's a whole bunch of tables and chairs, which the whole space is for us. And there are bathrooms both upstairs and downstairs. Uh, you can figure out the locations. But essentially, the whole auditorium and the outside foyers upstairs and downstairs, we can, we are free to use. Um, that's it, I think. So our first speaker to kick off the proceedings is Chris Herzog. Chris, you'll have to come and I can't see the, I can't see the file. You can't either. Oh, okay, I should probably just look. Yeah, I had it before. Ah, it's right there. Okay. Okay, great. Chris. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation, and uh, I feel it's a little bit of an honor here to, to kick things off. Um, some element of trust especially this is my first time giving this talk, uh, so it may be a little bit rough, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I, I want to talk about some work um, that I'm doing with a student, a very good student named Volodya Skaub, uh, and I'll, I'll try to point out where his contributions are really essential as we go forward. And it's about fermions in boundary conformal field theory, uh, crossing symmetry, and the epsilon expansion. And these, these words will become clearer as we, as we go forward. I've, put here a picture of graphene on the first slide uh, to indicate some potential experimental applications of this work, although the details there are still very much a work in progress, and I'd be interested to hear any insights uh, the audience might have uh, more toward the end of the talk. I think that's probably what's maybe holding us from putting out anything. Otherwise, the work is, is basically done. We could have probably put it out last week. All right, so let's, let's go forward. The work here I'm talking about, it, it could have been done, I think, in the late 1970s or early 1980s, but for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, wasn't. Uh, I'm interested in, in the following three theories in 2 plus epsilon, 3 minus epsilon, and 4 minus epsilon dimensions that involve a massless relativistic fermion psi and some kind of interaction. And in the three-dimensional case, I'll have also a scalar and also the four-dimensional, and, and at least two of these theories have, have names. They're so famous and have so many papers written about them. One's been called the gross nouveau model. I think it was introduced in about 1974, so it's slightly older than I am. And the Yukawa model, which I guess maybe even older, has this nice Yukawa interaction. Sometimes this is also called the gross nouveau Yukawa model because it's, it was talked about in the 1974 paper as well, I think. Uh, the third theory, I don't have a name associated to it, and so I put a question mark here, and I was hoping to crowdsource. If, if some of you have seen this before in the literature, we can improve our, our citations a little bit. And the question I want to ask is, what happens when you add a boundary? Uh, so as far as I know, 
essentially all the literature about these theories has to do with the you know, infinite system, you know, three dimensions, no boundary, maybe nice fall off conditions at infinity uh, for the fields. Uh, but what happens if you add, say, a nice planar boundary and ask what happens in the semi-infinite system where you have some nice set of boundary conditions at that plane? And I'm further going to be interested in uh, so-called conformal fixed points, so where this theory preserves some kind of conformal symmetry, because the tools I'm going to use uh, take advantage of a lot of recent developments in the literature uh, that involve this, this conformal symmetry. So yeah, I think if this, pa this, this paper had been written in 1978 or 1982, it would really have been three papers or maybe even six papers, one for each of these. But because of the recent techniques and, and improvements in the, in the field, we can do it all at once. I think it's just convention. So the, the nice thing people often do with the gross Neveu and Yukawa is they try to interpolate uh, between two and four dimensions. So you could do some epsilon expansion up to, I don't know, epsilon to the fourth might be state of the art now for these models. And then you set epsilon equal to one and you say, ah, now I know what happens in the 3D theory. And because you have two uh, ways of approaching that 3D theory, maybe you have better control over what happens in 3D. Three minus epsilon is just a choice. Again, I, I, if, if you've seen this before, let me know. Sorry, epsilon is always positive for you? No, but yes, I mean, conventionally, I think the interesting direction is probably epsilon is positive. The Townsend and, oh, excellent. Tell me later and we'll add a citation. Okay, okay so uh, my talk divides up into three pieces. I have some motivation, um, some formal developments uh, behind this perturbative calculation, but allow, what's gonna allow us to do this much more efficiently and more quickly. And in particular, it's this uh, development of so-called spinner conformal blocks and uh, the application of crossing symmetry. So it's related to this, this notion of the conformal bootstrap and we'll say more about that as we go forward. And then finally, I'll give you some results. Um, so we have some surface anomalous dimensions, which I believe we've computed for the first time, uh, and it's you know, experimental aspects of you know, how could we actually measure those surface anomalous dimensions that I'd also ask the audience to maybe help crowdsource if you have some interesting way of maybe measuring that. I think it'd be very interesting. Um, and useful, and then there's gonna be a special aspect for each of these three theories that I wrote down on the first slide that I can tell you a little bit more about given, given time. Okay, so again, the emphasis uh, in this talk is always gonna be on, on conformal symmetry. I need some conformal uh, symmetry preserved by these theories in order to apply uh, these, these techniques in the second part of the talk. Great. So, why, why be interested in these, in these kinds of theories? So we can go back, say, to the original paper by Gross and Neveu from 1974, and, and they write this. Our reason for choosing them is that they are, with the exception of Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions, the only known asymptotically free theories. Thus, the idea is to throw some light on the above problems in a theory which one can hope to make reasonable approximations. So, so my translation of that is, you know, you're, you're introducing these models as sort of some sort of computable way of addressing perceived problems with the standard model of particle physics. So maybe it's the problem of confinement, maybe it's you didn't like the fact that you had to introduce a Higgs. In fact, that's what they meant by above problems. They were trying to find some way of getting rid of the Higgs sector, replacing this uh, Higgs particle with some dynamical way of breaking, uh, breaking the electroweak sector symmetry, as far as I understood from their introduction. So these are you know, big important theories that were introduced 30, 40, 50 years ago. And you know, why, why, add a, why add a boundary? So for me, I come at this thinking that boundaries are a great way to do new physics. It seemed to be a fundamental question uh, that, many, that hasn't really been addressed in the literature in any significant way. And so you can do a calculation that no one's done before and hang your hat on it and say, here, I've computed the surface anomalous dimension of this important theory for the first time. So that's what gets me out of bed in the morning to some extent. Uh, but let, let's try to put a, a little bit broader, more scientific context on that. Um, and, and maybe try and understand why this wasn't done before. 
So if you think about a high energy context, I think maybe boundaries are, are, are fairly unnatural for us. And maybe one way of thinking about that is the Klein paradox. Like if you have the Dirac equation and you try and put a potential barrier for your electrons to travel through, you wind up making it a well for the positrons and the electrons aren't, aren't really bounded on one side of the potential at all. That's this Klein paradox. They just tunnel through the barrier without any trouble. So it's a little bit unnatural in that context maybe to think about you know, building a boundary for a relativistic fermion. Maybe that's one reason people have shied away for it. But nevertheless, they have appeared. So uh, one place I've seen it is the so-called MIT bag model. So that was an early model of the, the nucleus of an atom where we know the hadrons are all confined in some small region. And so maybe one nice way of addressing that problem is just by hand to say, we're going to confine our quarks in a sphere and put some nice boundary condition on the sphere and keep them there. Not try to build it with some external potential at all. We know they're already confined by the inter their mutual interactions. We'll just treat it as some, I don't know, set of free quarks in a sphere with some boundary condition. Okay, so that's sort of the historical context from our field. But now, I think from a condensed matter point of view, there's much more immediate pressing reasons for thinking about these kinds of systems. So that's this advent of Dirac and vial materials. These are low energy materials where the electrons have some relativistic dispersion relation and uh, you can very naturally think about boundaries in a condensed matter context. You just break your material in half and there's your boundary. So here, here's, a, here's a maybe more specific example of that, graphene. Um, so what is graphene? It's this uh, hexagonal honeycomb lattice. It's a bipartite lattice, which brings me back to days of working with Ami Hanani on bipartite quivers. But here, uh, here um, you know, th these are the sites of the carbon atoms, and you can develop some kind of nearest neighbor hopping model for the electrons, where they hop from, say, the A sites to the B sites. And uh, in momentum space, you get this nice uh, Fermi surface that emerges from, from this nearest neighbor hopping model. And you zoom it, you fill it, half filling, so you fill it up to these nodes. And you zoom in on these nodes, and you find out that the, for, for a low energy effective theory of this, this material, the electrons have this linear dispersion relation. So they're not really moving at the speed of light. They're moving very slowly with respect to the speed of light, 1 over 300 with respect to the speed of light. Um, but near these points, uh, these K and K prime points in the Brillouin zone, you have, nevertheless, from a free, free electron point of view, you have massless relativistic fermions. So there's an electron that hops from the A to the B site uh, near K, which is, say, one two-component relativistic fermion. You've got another electron with momentum close to K prime, which also hops. That's another two-component relativistic fermion. You put them together, and in the language of the first slide, I now have a, a model with, say, two flavors of fermions in 3D. Um, and uh, I can now start to think about interactions and boundaries. So I, I mentioned I'm really interested in the conformal case, right? I want to apply the, the, the techniques of conformal symmetry to these models. And uh, I'll just recall that if I have a massless fermion, fermion without mass, it has this full conformal symmetry group. It has Poincaré, it has special conformal transformations, it has dilatations, and so it all fits together into this SOD comma two symmetry group. Now if I introduce a boundary, I've got to break some of that group. I've got to break translations at least normal to the boundary, and I'll break some other stuff as well. So I basically break the conformal group to the conformal group of the boundary, so one dimension less, SOD minus one comma two. And so in this talk, I want to focus on theories which preserve that SOD minus one comma two symmetry group. That's gonna be built in, baked into the analysis. If they don't have that symmetry group, I'm not gonna be able to say anything using the techniques at my disposal today. So how do I get that symmetry group? In graphene, there are two natural ways of cutting it, the hexagonal lattice, and you see it in this, in this slide. So at the top, I have the so-called zigzag edges, and at the bottom, I have these so-called armchair edge. And I learned recently from a paper by Biswas and Semenov that the zigzag edge uh, satisfies in the continuum limit this particular kind of boundary condition where I use the, the time component of the gamma matrix, gamma matrices to make this uh, projection operator at the zigzag edge. Or I can use the armchair edge where, where I use the, the, 
the gamma matrix normal to the boundary uh, to make these kinds of projection operators on the two components of the fermions. Okay, so those are the two natural boundary conditions you get for graphene. And one of them indeed preserves this conformal symmetry. Yeah. Well, there's other things you can do. You like you want to cut at some crazy angle. Yeah, and then it, it, it's less nice. And uh, yeah, you can imagine some mixture of these two. It just comes out, the claim is it just comes out of the, uh, the nearest hopping model. Like you, you want to set the, like the, the, the wave function, components of the wave, her, her, electron wave function to zero at the edge. And if you translate that back into the continuum limit, this is what it looks like. Now the details of that at the moment escape me. And I actually, <laughs> I wrote to Gordon last night and he wrote back and said, yes, yes, this is the way it works. And then I tried to make, see how it works. So I, I think I see how the zigzag egg, edge works, but in fact, the details of the armchair edge elude me, and uh, it's, a, it's a little bit subtle how to set this up, but this is the claim. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Does that zigzag edge preserve Lorentz invariance along, I mean, it looks like you picked up the time direction to be special. Excellent. This is my next slide. Thanks, Napo. So, it turns out the armchair edge will preserve the full SOD minus 1 comma 2 symmetry. That's the claim. But the zigzag boundary actually only preserves some relatively small subset. It only preserves time translation, space translation, and scale transformation. So it's an interesting example of some theory with scale transformation, scale trans, uh, scale transformation without the full conformal symmetry. But, uh, and that's actually the case they focus on in this paper. It's a very nice paper if you want to read it. But they've left the other case open for us to think about. So let's think about the other case, because I want to use conformal symmetry. I, I, I don't want to be stuck in this. Uh, uh, this example with much less symmetry. And I'll just point out that the same armchair boundary condition was picked at, or, or projection, I mean it wasn't form, formulated in terms of graphene, the same kind of projection operator was, was picked out long ago by McCavity and Osborne when they first started thinking about boundary conformal field theories. They, they looked at these free fermions with boundaries. And it also appears in the MIT bag model. So this boundary condition has appeared before. Okay, so now I want to add interactions, and it gets a bit murky. This is sort of the uncomfortable slide in the talk where I have to wave my arms a little bit too much. Uh, so in, in graphene, the interactions are their, what they're Coulomb interactions between the electrons, right? And they're basically instantaneous from the point of view of these slowly moving relativistic electrons. And they're also naively very large because since the electrons are, are moving so slowly, the fine structure constant gets enhanced. It's not like 1 over 137 anymore. It's more like 1. So it's not really a perturbative theory, naively. Although people have made various arguments that you know, the coupling should flow under RG and so forth. And you can wave your hands and maybe, maybe, maybe it should work out better. So what I'd like to kind of wave my hands and argue here is that you, know, you can maybe hope to tune the coupling, maybe by mechanically straining the lattice, building the graphene sheet on some uh, material that, that changes where the, the carbon atoms are relative to where they'd like to be. Maybe you can tune it to some kind of phase transition, uh, and maybe you can you know, invoke some kind of universality. Many different starting points will lead to the same CFT. So I'm interested, maybe, is there some kind of phase transition, second order phase transition you can engineer in graphene, maybe by straining the straining the, the lattice by growing it on a different substrate. And maybe at that, that fixed point, we can apply the, the kinds of uh, uh, theories that I wrote down on the first page. That would be the hand wavy hope. Can you check on the interaction is relevant or irrelevant from the perspective of the Gaussian fixed point? Um, so, yeah. It, I think people often argue that these couplings are irrelevant in graphene, that they should maybe flow to zero at long distance. Uh, but it's more complicated than that. Be because the Coulomb interactions are basically instantaneous and you have this relatively slow moving electron, it's not really Lorentz invariant and you have beta functions for other things you're not used to having, like beta functions for the speed of the electron. Um, so it's, it's a more complicated story and I'm not sure the, the final statement has been made, but I'm not alone in hoping this. I mean, I've read this in other papers, for example, by Herbert. I think he has some dream that you could, you could do this kind of, kind of thing. <laughs>
So can we learn something about the universality class of a phase transition in this class of models by, by looking at these relativistic interacting fermions? That's the question behind the motivation of the talk. All right, so that's end of part one. Any other questions? Excellent. Yeah, so in the zigzag case, there are. There are boundary edge states in the zigzag case. I believe in the armchair case, there are not. Yeah. No, it, it, it's a very interesting question about it. Yeah, but what happens at the edge, so just from a free theory point of view. It's, it's realized by the massless fermions. They are not localized, they're subject to that boundary condition at the bottom of the slide, yeah. So it's just the Dirac equation on the half space with that boundary condition. And the claim is they, they have a SO, this D minus one comma two symmetry group, yeah. And, and you can do it just for one, I mean, you can cross out the second component if you want, just focus on the first. That's right, it's just the direction normal to the boundary. Other questions? All right, let's go on. I'm probably running short on time already. Um, so what's my strategy? I wanna compute a correlation function. I'll now sort of retreat, retreat back into pure formal theory mode. I have these three theories I wrote down on the first slide. How do we analyze them? I wanna analyze the two-point function at the electron. Uh, and from that, I wanna extract some data for the corresponding boundary conformal field theory. So we know boundary conformal field theories, they're defined by an operator spectrum along with some scaling dimensions and OPE coefficients or equivalently three-point functions. So can we get some of that data? We're not gonna do all of it, but some of it from this two-point function. And I wanna use two techniques. So the first is to use the equation of motion to constrain this two-point function. This was a, was a nice paper by Richkov and Tan about, I guess, already seven years ago. Uh, for the ON model, so just a scalar theory with, say, a 5 4 interaction. They use this, I think, quite effectively to get this kind of data in an epsilon expansion without really getting their hands too dirty. They don't have to compute a lot of Feynman diagrams to get out these anomalous dimensions. And it was followed up shortly after for fermions without a boundary. And then, even more recently, there's this Giambi paper, uh, which is very closely related to the work we're doing, uh, where they even look at fermions with a boundary. Okay, so. Just by using the equations of motion, you can get at some of this conformal data quite efficiently. So we're gonna add a new wrinkle to that, uh, and we're gonna apply some bootstrap techniques. Um, so you solve the equation of motion at some maybe first or second order differential equation, it leaves some integration constants, and we'll fix them by matching uh, to the so-called bulk and boundary conformal block expansions. So we're applying a crossing symmetry constraint. It's not maybe really in the spirit of the original bootstrap, which was much more theory agnostic where you don't maybe assume an equation of motion, you just maybe assume some symmetries and so forth, but it is bootstrap-ish what we're doing. We're applying this crossing symmetry constraint. And what's nice about this is that I think it's technically a whole lot simpler than computing Feynman diagrams. You could have done all this again in 1978, but it would have been a lot more work then because you would have begun by trying to develop a perturbation theory for this model and you would have written down a propagator for your electron and you realize that you know, you've lost the translation invariant, so you can't use momentum space anymore. And in real space, you've got this extra term now on the propagator, which is this image piece, and things just get messy quite quickly. And also, you'll find you'll need new RG uh, counter terms that are not in the bulk now, but are associated with terms on the boundary. So there's sort of a more elaborate RG prescription and a more elaborate perturbative uh, set of Feynman rules that you could you use to do this, it will all work, uh, but using these two methods in combination, it, it all kind of falls into your lap without, without much difficulty at all. Can, can I ask the second item, is it Schwinger-Dyson? Is this Schwinger-Dyson? Uh, not, at the, I, I guess eventually it would be, but at the level we're doing it, it's just, it, it's just a perturbative expansion. We're just going to the first few orders in an epsilon expansion. I, I, I think of Schwinger-Dyson as trying to get at some non-perturbative set uh, of equations eventually. Question, you can try to solve it right, right. If you get the symmetry, you can also try to solve it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have the bulk 
conformal block expansion uh, in the context of boundary conformal field theory. In this case, you bring your two spinner operators or other operators close together, and you express it as a sum over local operators in the bulk. And in conformal field theory, operator spectrum is grouped in multiplets. So you have a conformal primary, which is this O delta, but then you have all the descendants uh, that you get by acting with momentum, or this partial x. Sorry, the battery on this seems to have disappeared. So that partial x will act on my primary and generate all the descendants, and so this sum is organized into multiplets in the bulk. A nice thing about boundary conformal uh, field theory is only scalar operators get non-zero expectation values. So usually the sum would be over all kinds of spinning operators in the bulk. But in this case, it's just over scalars. And so the whole sum simplifies to a sum over the scalars in this uh, bulk operator product expansion. And this object here, uh, the C acting on the one-point function expectation value, uh, that's the so-called bulk conformal block or conformal partial wave. Oh, maybe I can use this. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I have to back up a little bit. Yeah, so this is this is like momentum that acts on my primary and gives me my my set of descendants. So the other thing I can do in boundary conformal field theory is I can bring the operators close to the boundary and decompose them into a, a, a sum over boundary operators. And that's what this hat is. The hat are the boundary, boundary quantities. And again, it organizes itself into multiplets, so I get a boundary primary, say rho hat delta, plus all its descendants, which are generated by this, this, uh, this function C delta hat. And now I, I can organize my two-point function as a sum over these boundary conformal blocks. You notice there's a C delta squared, so there's a sort of nice positivity that comes in with the boundary. Uh, and so to implement this, this constraint of crossing symmetry, to see that these two procedures are equivalent, it would be nice first to work out these, these conformal blocks. And that's something that hadn't really been done uh, before our paper. Yes, I think, I, think that's, I think you've answered your own question. I, I believe that you should be able to do some kind of radial quantization where a sphere is centered on the boundary where you can, uh, you can justify this kind of operator product expansion. I haven't actually, honestly, I haven't thought about it too carefully. I've mostly just taken it for granted. But I, yeah, this is not, this is not my assumption, but uh, has a long history going back many years. Um, it's a good question. Okay, so to apply this effectively, I, I, I want to put a few more constraints on the spinner two-point function. So if I, I could actually maybe back up a little bit and think about what are the constraints on the spinner two-point function before I start thinking about the conformal block decomposition. So it turns out just from the constraints of conformal symmetry, I can express this two-point function as a sum over two tensor structures or two spinner structures. <clears throat> so already with a two-point function, there's an invariant cross ratio you can, you can construct, something that's invariant under this boundary conformal group. It's written there, this C, which is x minus x prime squared over the product of the distances to the boundary. And I can write a general spinner two-point function in, in terms of two of these functions of cross ratio, capital F and capital G. So I want to write my conformal block decomposition in terms of the capital F and capital G. So I've gone through this little technical detail so you can understand uh, the solution uh, to this conformal block expansion on the, on the next slide. So here it is. We can either write F and G in terms of a bulk block expansion, these F and G without the hat, so they're all written in terms of uh, hypergeometric functions, or we can write them in terms of decomposition on the boundary, that's the F and G with the hats, also hypergeometrics. Okay. Um, and what is the other data here? So delta one and delta two, those would be the conformal dimensions of the bulk spinners. Uh, the delta would be the dimension of the exchanged operator in the operator product expansion. And C, of course, is this cross ratio. P is basically the dimension of the boundary. I could have just written it all in terms of D, but I didn't. So how did we get this? I, I won't bore you with the details of all this. Um, there, there are two ways. One is, I think, pretty clear from how I developed it. If you know what this funny uh, differential operator C delta is, 
well, then you can just perform the sum over descendants explicitly and, and generate these hypergeometrics. metrics. That's one way, of, one way we did it. Another slightly simpler way is you can use the fact that the conformal blocks are eigenfunctions of the conformal Casimir operator. You solve some system of second order differential equations. This is often a little bit complicated, especially in, for higher tensor modes, because you're, you're not just going to get one second order differential equation. You get some whole system of them. And so there's a further epicycle here where you use the so-called embedding space and conformal integrals to find the solutions. And this is work that Vologia did. He's a real fan of embedding space and conformal integrals. And this is the way we first generated all these conformal blocks. And then we checked it using the sums. So we're pretty sure they're right. Uh, and then in some sense, this paper is a way of testing, testing this technology. So the boundary conformal blocks were known already. Uh, it's interesting, I wrote them down. 2019, but not in a particularly usable form. And then they were known even earlier, although I think if you ask these fellows at the time they wrote the paper, they might not have realized that either. They might have said, oh no, we're just looking at ADS-CFT and we're computing bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagators for spinners, which turns out to be the same thing. So it's, it, there are very interesting and tight connections between what I'm showing you here and, and uh, uh, ADS-CFT dictionary, ADS holography. And the bulk propagators, as far as I know, are, 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 uh, are computed here for the first time. Okay. So with that technical development, with the development of these boundary and bulk conformal blocks, we're able to make a little bit more progress with these, with these three theories. Okay, so that's the second part of my talk. Are there any questions before I go on? Yes. Psi to a positive so in, in, when you use the higher dimension, it's psi to something positive. When you use the things in the boundary, the hats, the S hats, etc., it's psi of inverse. Oh, here. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, thank you. That's a, that's a good point. So there, there are two very natural limits of this cross ratio, right? There's a limit where x goes to x prime, that's the coincident limit where c gets small. And there's another natural limit where you bring the operators close to the boundary. That's when z and z prime get small, and that's where c goes off to infinity. And so these corresponding conformal blocks have, have nice expansions precisely in those limits. So here's the bulk, bulk block has a nice expansion in the coincident limit, where c gets small, and the boundary one has a nice expansion where c gets very large when you get close to the boundary. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, they have different symmetry properties. Um, one has an extra gamma matrix, and indeed you can use that, I think, to your advantage when you, you study the corresponding, if you're doing some perturbative calculation, you're gonna find that certain classes of Feynman diagrams only contribute to one of those structures and certain contribute only to the other. Uh, yes, yes, I guess, yeah, depending on, yeah. Depending on how many dimensions you are and how many gamma matrices, yeah. That's three, right? Three I'm in four and three and two uh, and, and yeah, yeah. But then why is it not more? Um, is this the only structures? These are the only structures that show up. Um, oh, you're, yeah, you're worried about, huh? I'm worried about more gammas. So I thought if you're in three, then of course. I think these are the only ones that show up, but you're right, I should, uh, I should think a little bit more carefully about epsilon terms, yeah. I, I, I think it, this is, these are also the structures that show up in the free theory. And you can sort of think about the two as like a, the original guy that happens without a boundary and an image charge. Uh, and that's why there's this x tilde at minus z, it's like on the other side of the boundary. Um, but could there be more? I don't know. All right. Are these two things independent in all dimensions? Um, I, I, would, I would have thought that in, in, at least in d greater than two, I would have, greater than or equal to two, I would have thought so, but yeah. 
Okay, so results. Um, I have, what, maybe 15, 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So the Yukawa model in four minus epsilon dimensions. So there's tight connection to what happens in the theory without a boundary. So the, the, the location of the RG fixed point is, is determined by the theory without a boundary. And so you can use a lot of the data that people have generated over the years for this theory that without a boundary. There, we, we know there's an IR fixed point when G squared and H are of order epsilon. Um, and we know what the constants of proportionality are too, up to say order epsilon to the fourth uh, from work, uh, uh, earlier work. But now we'll add a boundary. We'll choose Dirac layer Neumann boundary conditions for the scalar field. And we'll choose these armchair boundary conditions for the fermion, where chi is plus or minus one. And we'll use the equations of motion. So we apply d slash, the Dirac operator, uh, to either psi or psi bar. And we plug in what the equation of motion is on the right-hand side. And this means that uh, on the right-hand side, we can just evaluate on the right-hand side using the free field equations in Wick's theorem. Anything else will be suppressed by this factor of g squared. Because that's what makes it a little easier to do this, at least to the first few orders in, a, in an epsilon or order g squared ex expansion. And then you, you, know, you solve this at some second order system of differential equations. It has some integration constants. And then you fix all those integration constants by matching to the bulk and boundary conformal block expansions. And all this data just falls into your lap, basically. You get a whole bunch of anomalous dimensions for the bulk psi and phi fields, and those match what's been in the literature for the last 45 years. But you get a new result. You get this boundary uh, anomalous dimension two for the spinner, um, which matches what Giambi et al. had a, about a year ago. Of course, they didn't use this uh, conformal block technology. It didn't exist back then. They had slightly different techniques. But all this kind of just falls into your lap from this, this procedure. And you can also get from the, 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 the decomposition, you also get some data about the OPE, about the three-point functions and one-point functions of a whole tower of operators. So one nice thing about this, uh, this, this example is it, it's an illustration of what's been called the fake primary effect, um, which I think Petter in the audience, uh, Petter Kravchuk in the audience has worked on, pointed out. So here's the decomposition of this G function, this G of C, that, 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 that's used to construct the two-point function of the spinner. So here, here I'm decomposing it in the bulk uh, channel, the, con the bulk conformal block decomposition. So you, you have uh, one conformal block which corresponds to the bulk operator phi, and then you have a whole tower of operators which correspond basically to some, I don't know, pair of derivatives some k power acting on psi bar psi. So that's what gives you dimension 3 plus 2k. And what's interesting about this decomposition is you notice there's something missing. So k equals 0 is missing. There's no psi bar psi operator. It would be there in the free theory. If you were to decompose uh, this two-point function in the three, free theory in the, in the bulk channel, you would find psi bar psi. So where did it go? So we, there's another equation of motion. Uh, the psi bar psi. And so from that equation of motion, you see psi bar psi is actually descendant. So the minute you turn on an interaction, that operator psi bar psi is included in the first conformal block, the conformal block for phi. So that's one nice thing that sort of just falls into your lap in this theory. So that was, so each of these theories will have some special aspect. This was aspect for the, for the, uh, the Yukawa model. Here's gross nevo and 2 plus epsilon. Uh, so here there's a fixed point, well-known fixed point when g equals epsilon. And uh, we can apply the equations of motion twice. And we get this enormous looking expression on the right-hand side. But again, we can just evaluate that using Wick's theorem and, and the free field propagators. And the nice thing about this model is that for the same amount of work, because g is order epsilon and, it, and not square root of epsilon, for the same amount of work, you get results to order epsilon squared using only the free field uh, uh, on the right-hand side. So here are the results. So here's, you, know, you get bulk anomalous dimensions that kind of just fall into your lap for psi, psi squared, psi to the fourth, which matches the, the field, well-known field theory literature. But then you also get this boundary anomalous dimension, which is new. Actually, I think Giambi and friends calculated the order epsilon term, but only really the order epsilon squared term here is new. 
Um, and, uh, well, actually, from this procedure, you can you fix it up to the anomalous dimension for sine squared. But this, again, you can look up. It's a bulk data. So bulk data has all been computed before. It's independent of whether you have a boundary. You plug that in, and you get the full anomalous dimension. And another funny thing about this theory is that, whereas for the Yukawa model, to find out where the fixed point was, you had to you know, look at, look at the, the, the literature, you find the, the bulk computation of beta functions. Here, by going to order epsilon squared, you find that crossing symmetry on its own fixes uh, the critical value of the coupling. So again, this matches what's been in the, uh, what's been in the literature, but here you get it from the, from the procedure. It just falls into your lap. And then finally, this 3 minus epsilon dimension model, which maybe I should cite Townsend. Um, here, again, there's a fixed point for g squared order epsilon order h. And here we didn't, uh, we, we couldn't find uh, the bulk computation, the computation without a boundary. So we went and we did some Feynman diagram uh, calculations on our own. We found where the fixed point was. And here's the, here's the beta functions in the first few orders in g. It's interesting, it looks like there's a, a zero when it's supersymmetric, when ns equals nf equals one. And I believe that ties into some work by Shiraz, Manwala, and Ofer Aharoni, where they've been looking at these supersymmetric churn simons theories in three dimensions uh, for a long time. Anyway, so we did that standard bulk uh, computation without a boundary so we could match the results we find. And then we go through our procedure with the equations of motion and the bulk and boundary conformal block decompositions, and we get all this data. For the bulk uh, uh, conformal dimensions of psi, phi squared, psi squared, and psi phi, that all matches what we have uh, from our perturbative calculations without a boundary. And then finally, we get this new boundary anomalous dimension for the spinner, delta rho, uh, where we get it out to order epsilon. And here, here's one more nice thing about this model. So each, again, each model has its own nice thing. Funny thing about this model is it, it the boundary expands not in order of epsilon, but in order of square root epsilon. So there's a non-analyticity -anal in, the, in the boundary conformal dimensions. And there's a way of understanding why that happens. Um, something very similar happens if you get rid of the fermions. This was discussed a long time ago. Again, a lot of this calculation could have been done ages ago. So in particular, this theory without the fermions was studied in 1988, where they also find the square root of epsilon behavior for the boundary anomalous dimensions of scalars. Um, so what happens, the reason is that uh, in this theory, the expectation value of phi squared is not zero. So if you look at the equation of motion, you have the Dirac operator on the fermion equals g phi squared psi. So already at leading order, the right-hand side is non-zero. Whereas with the Yukawa model, you would have phi, and the expectation value of phi would have been zero, at least in the cases we analyzed it. There is a way of introducing an expectation value for phi in the Yukawa model. It's called the extraordinary phase, uh, but that we didn't analyze. That's a story, a story for another day. Okay, so that's the three, three uh, lessons, right? That we could get to order epsilon squared for gross nevus. We get square root of epsilon behavior for this three-dimensional model and uh, the fake primary effect for the Yukawa model. Okay, I'm probably pretty much out of time. Um, so it determines the boundary conditions for the scalar. S is for scalar, so it's either plus or minus one. Uh, so if you compute phi squared in the free theory, it's either plus or minus this value, depending on whether you had Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions for the scalar field. How much time? Two minutes. One minute, 30 seconds. So I had a few more slides, which I think I won't go over if you want to ask a question. It's, it's some speculations about how to think about this boundary value, uh, or boundary anomalous dimension for the spinner field and how to measure it. And a couple slides showing how people have measured similar things for the scalar theory uh, in the past. But I, I won't spend time on it unless you want to ask me a question. Um, but I'll leave you with this image, which is a Im STM image of graphene near an armchair edge. You can really see the electron distribution near an edge. And I, I wonder, right, if through some suitable cross-graining of this picture, you could get at these kinds of anomalous dimensions. I have no idea. It's speculation. And here's my summary. I've given you some bulk conformal blocks for spinners. That was new. I've given you a calculation of this boundary spinner 
uh, anomalous dimension and three different interacting fermionic models. And there's a moral from each model, the Yukawa model and the fake primary effect, uh, the expansion and squared of epsilon from three dimensions, and the uh, order epsilon squared results for gross niveau. Okay, so thanks very much. I can. So there's this Giambi paper, which we were inspired by heavily, uh, and there's, there's two sets of analyses in that paper. So the second half of the paper is the order epsilon expansion, and the first half is a large N analysis. And one thing they point out, which I thought was quite nice, um, so I said at the beginning of the talk, right, that um, people were interested in these two and four dimensional models as a way of kind of interpolating to three dimensions. And now there's an interesting question, how does that interact with boundary conditions? So in the four minus epsilon case, there's three kinds of boundary conditions you could choose. There's Dirichlet and Neumann, which I spent most of the talk uh, uh, hammering on about. And there's this third one, which I kind of swept under the rug, the extraordinary case where phi has an expectation value. So if, if, if these match onto each other, what matches onto what? Uh, and the claim in Giambi from the large N analysis is it's actually the extraordinary phase transition uh, in four dimensions, which should map on to the two-dimensional case. So that's one result in their, in their paper. Um, Yeah, so if you look at some of these, uh, Minwala, Haroni, and there's a bunch of collaborators uh, whose names I don't remember, um, the supersymmetric theory looks a bit like what I've written here on the second line, plus a turin simons term, and then plus, uh, since phi and psi are going to be part of the same chiral multiplet, you can have a flavor mixing term. So you can have like a phi psi type trace over the representation, and that whole thing squared. So that's the supersymmetric version of this theory. But in the case where nf and ns equals 1, that extra flavor mixing term, it's degenerate with the one I've written. And so it should be supersymmetric, I think. And maybe the beta function shouldn't run. And that probably explains why we found that 0 of the beta function there. Any more questions? So I, I've been focusing on the case where it's a semi-infinite boundary. So it's not just near the boundary. It's everything in this semi-infinite system. Um, yes, it would be very interesting to look at more general kinds of boundaries or strips and so forth. Now, the issue with that is that I, I, was, I was emphasizing that I, I'm interested in conformal symmetry. And it's, in general, quite difficult to do that consistent with conformal symmetry. So you add in an extra boundary, and now you have a strip, and now you have a length scale, and that's not consistent with scale invariance. Or if you have a circle, again, there's a radius, and typically uh, that will also not be consistent. Although there's certain cases where you can do this, like if you have a, I think if it's a circle also that involves time, um, then there's a conformal transformation which will allow you to consider such a, such a boundary. But it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit trickier. Hyperbolic space is another uh, natural boundary to consider in this, in this kind of setup, which relates to ADS-CFT that I was talking about before. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Thanks.